Thankful for Jason Huffman filling in yesterday. If you've noticed, uh, last week I mean, um, I'm not in Liberia. Uh, I had the chance this last weekend to move up a friend um, to Idaho who was, attended this church, and um, we, he had some cars to drive up and some things to drive up, and so we drove 15 hours up to Idaho, spent uh, the Sunday up there with him, and actually went to Nathan's father's church. So Nathan, who leads worship for us, went to his church, and it was so interesting what he said that uh, Doug, I believe, ministered so well during the ministry moment. Their entire church brought Zach and I up and prayed over us while we were there. And the prayer was so interesting. And in Idaho, you know it's different. Um, we actually had lunch with someone. It's not different in a negative way. It's different in a wonderful way. Um, and we had lunch with someone, and she looked at me, and she goes, um, you conservative Republicans that come to Idaho, you realize you're a progressive Democrat when you come here. You know, and <laughs> so it was like, okay, take the California plates off the car. You know, it was like one of those things. And I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I just pray and ask the Lord who he wants in leadership, and I pray I go the way of the Spirit um, one way or the other. But at the other side of it, um, it was interesting because during the prayer time, they said, totally had turned the corner, uh, tur- flipped the corner on us and said, you guys in California, as the way of California goes the country, and they said, you're on the front lines, hold the line. And I took that phrase with me, hold the line. And we have an opportunity as a church in California where sin abounds, grace abounds. People say we're post-Christian. I believe we are pre-revival. And there's an opportunity for us to hold the line. And so I'm grateful on 4th of July, you are celebrating our freedom by holding the line and being in church. So I'm grateful for that opportunity. As well, I was then supposed to go to Liberia. Well, they had their third wave of COVID. I would have been stuck there for three to four months. So I decided to stay. Um, And so here I am, thankful to be with you. We're going to be in the book of Acts. Jason did a phenomenal job in Acts chapter 20. I'm going to pick out just a verse from the book of Acts because there's something that happened at Hume that you heard. They spoke about Moses and the Exodus and all that God wanted to do. Well, there was a scene with Moses where he would come down off the mountain and he would so shine the glory of God that no one could look at him. So what he did was he put a veil over his face until the glory weared off. Well, you've heard it before, maybe students, there's oftentimes a hume high, and then you've got to go down into the valley low. And as a church, we understand that. Sometimes we can be sitting in church, and we've got that worship experience, and Gannon is leading us to the throne room, and something in the Word of God touches our heart and our life, and we know we're changed. It's the church high. And then we face the parking lot, and all of a sudden, we hit the valley low. And all of the wonder of the high of being in the worship service is lost when we're in traffic. Well, Paul knows that. He knows about the Hume High. He knows about the church experience. And he doesn't want the glory of God to wear off of us like it did for Moses because we have the Spirit of God in us. And he wants to empower us no matter where he is at. So we're going to be in where we're at. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, you can take one from the seat back pocket in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, make sure you take that one home with you. We'll be sure to replace it. Why don't you go with me to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts for his word in Acts 20. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that as we study scripture that you will speak to our hearts, change us, and make us more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul is on a spiritual retreat with the group of elders from Ephesus. Take a look. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Now, let me 
give you a little example of Miletus. It was a town, a city. It had four natural harbors. There was a Roman gymnasium. There was a Roman stadium that seated about 15,000 people. It was a place where people could get away and a place where people could retreat. It was the, well, city-like Hume Lake experience for these uh, leaders from Ephesus. Now, Miletus was about 30 miles away from Ephesus, and Paul wanted to bring the leaders out for a spiritual retreat, not in their hometown, but in a different town. Now, that 30 miles would take them just as long as it took our Hume Lake gang to head up to Hume Lake, hours to go 30 miles for a spiritual retreat. Now, once they arrived at Miletus, it was beautiful with its Roman stadium and with its uh, uh, Greco-Roman gymnasium and the four harbors and the mountains that surrounded, it was like showing up at Hume Lake or like coming to church after a really rough week. And that worship starts or that chapel experience starts like Torin said, and all of a sudden, everything begins to change. And so Paul Using this spiritual retreat, let's pick it up on verse uh, 18. And when they came to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. He begins with his testimony. You've watched my life. You've seen me. Just like some of you will see me in Ralph's and you'll do that uh, uh, wonderful thing of what's in his cart. I know you're looking when I see you, okay? And I love to see you and I love to see you looking because I should have a testimony. Well, our students at Hume, they heard the testimony of Pastor Chris. And they heard the testimony of his family and the struggles. And he was real with the trials that he was walking through. And he used his testimony for the glory of God, just like the Apostle Paul would, just like I would when I share an illustration of something that's going on in my personal life or my marriage or with my children, to be able to show my testimony. Well, the Bible goes on to say how I serve the Lord with all humility. So Doug Armstrong comes up, and he's over 50, and there he is serving a week at Hume Lake with all humility, along with Jimmy, along with Dana, along with Michelle, along with Emily, along with KC, along with all of our other counselors. They go up there for a week, and they pour their heart into ministering to those students in the same way. Every week, I want you to know something. When I'm preparing a message, I'm not trying to gather information to impress you with what I know. In fact, I'm not a really smart person. It takes me a long time to get a message, and you don't know how many times I've got to practice saying these Greek names and these Greek words before they actually come out of my mouth. And then when they do, I'm so nervous to say it because I don't know exactly what, how to say it that I even mess it up after I've practiced. But there's one thing that I do do when I'm preparing for a message. I ask the Lord to throw pictures of your faces in my mind. And I begin to pray for you as individuals. Because when I look out, I don't see a crowd, I see a person. And my heart as a pastor is to be humble enough to recognize that God has put me into this place to speak into a person's life in the same way that Doug spoke into my son's life up at Hume Lake. And Paul says, I serve the Lord with all humility. And then he goes on to say, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house. Stop there if you would for a moment, he taught them the Word of God. You see, what I love the fact is when I went to Idaho and they said, hold the line, this church is holding the line by preaching the Word of God. This is not a self-help church. This is not a how-to-make-you-better church. This is how you are to glorify God kind of church. And the way that we'll learn how to glorify God is if we learn the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and faith pleases God. And so you know what our students learned? 
They learned Deuteronomy chapter 31 that God is with them. He's with them now. He's with them today. They learned that He's merciful and gracious in Exodus chapter 34. They learned for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, and they learned that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. They learned the Word of God. Just like every Sunday I preach from the book of Acts, or on every Wednesday we go through the chronology of the life of Christ, the Word of God, I pray, is how we will hold the line. But something happened at Hume Lake, and I pray that happens here and happens in your own life. Take a look, if you would. It's Acts chapter 20. We're going to pick it up in verse 21. Testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. When the students went up to Hume, they didn't hear this. You better not do this, and you better not do this, and you better not do this. That's not what they heard. You see, the counselors were not moral police. The counselors were not judging them. The counselors were not denouncing them. Now, the counselors were following the example of the Apostle Paul, and I pray we will follow the example of our counselors. They were preaching repentance towards God. They were preaching a faith toward Jesus Christ. They were not the moral police. They were moral agents. And they were pointing people to God. They were not pointing out their sin. You see, Paul, he didn't make a practice in Ephesus, which he could have. I mean, remember, they worshiped Diana. It was filled with sexual immorality. There was nothing but immorality going on in the city of Ephesus. And Paul made a point to say, you remember my testimony. I led you to God. I pointed you to Jesus. And I pray that's true in your life. I pray you're the counselor just like our students. My, my son came home and he was with Daddy Doug. And he, uh, 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 Timon told me and, t- and Doug told me that Daddy Doug, Elder Doug, okay, he wasn't just Daddy Doug for our students. He became Daddy Doug for all of Hume Lake. Students were coming up to him not because they thought, if I go to Daddy Doug, he's going to tell me everything I do is wrong. No, Doug made them feel accepted. Doug made them feel valued. Doug listened to where they were at and didn't choose to judge them. No, he preached a repentance towards God. Let me make you and God right, and let me tell you how much Jesus loves you and cares for you. He showed them acceptance. He showed them God's incredible grace, and their lives were changed. So I was driving home with my son the other day. His life was changed, and I'd like you to hear how his life was changed. Timon, would you come up? on yep. yes okay I just really wanted to quickly say um, a little part of my story and how I got to this point today and just how my life has been completely changed by the love of God um, I think it all started at the beginning of COVID and during lockdown when we all were going through struggles and we were all going through trials but I think that was when I really turned away from God and I really didn't see his light in my life anymore and I just became, and I just started trying to fill um, my life with so many worldly pleasures and worldly things. And I just realized this week at um, Hume Lake that my one and only pleasure that I can get is from God. And I, had my, I was having my one-on-one with Doug, and his love for me um, just showed me the love of God. And I just wanted to say quickly in Romans 8.28... It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. I know after this week, I'm I'm called for God's purpose, and I know that no matter what I do in my life, it is always going to glorify God. And I just wanted to say, why would you gamble your eternity? Why would you gamble the fact that you cannot be saved by God when you can? And I love each and every one of you, and thank you. Thank you, Doug.
I lost it in the first service. I'm losing it again. Give me a second. Um, Doug didn't win my son over telling him how wrong his actions could be. And I wonder if in our world we're a daddy Doug. I wonder if in our world, the world looks at us and goes, you're safe, I can come to you. You're not going to judge me, you'll accept me. You'll receive me. I wonder if in our world, the people that are around us, would they look at us and say, you're someone I can come to when I've got a need. I know my life needs to change, and I've watched you live your life. And it was in one meeting, not a hundred meetings, not even an hour, the connection, the acceptance began to do something and shape something in my son's heart. You see, Paul knew this. And at this spiritual retreat with these Ephesian elders, he brings them to Miletus because he wants to encourage them. He wants to build them up. He wants to edify them. And as Jason taught last week, he commends them to God and to his grace, not his law. He commended him to his grace. You see, God's grace was such that he sent his son to die on a cross for you and for me. And Jesus Christ, he came, he lived the sinless life because he knew that we couldn't. He fulfilled the perfect life. And then he paid the price of our sin and he died on a cross, but he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the grave. He conquered death. And because he conquered the very thing that was keeping us from God, now he has the keys to life and to death. And he offers them to you and says, I can give you eternity. And like Timon said, why would you gamble your eternity? That's his grace. And the way that we get his grace across to this world is by being grace-filled. Which one of you deserved heaven? Which one of you cleaned up your act before you came to God? Wasn't it God's acceptance, his love, his loving kindness that drew you to repentance? And so Paul encourages them. But Paul knows about the human high. And Paul knows about the church high. He knows about the valley low and he knows the traffic that you're going to face. And he knows that the glory of God can begin to fade out of your life. And so what Paul does in this sermon is he begins to warn them about not falling into the valley low, but to let the glory of God continue to shine out of you. So he warns them and he says to them, hey, listen, I got to tell you something. Jason taught it last week. There's going to be some savage wolves that come your way. Savage. Let me tell you about a wolf. A wolf does not spare the flock, okay? They're hungry. They want to devour. They want to destroy. They want to eat every blessed thing. I'll never forget, we had a fox get into our chicken coop at, in Montana. 38 chicken massacre, okay? We went out the next morning. It was absolutely disgusting. Something's happening. Just go with it. Could be the Lord agreeing with me. I'm not sure. There we go. Just want to give it a chance. And I want to warn you. And I want to warn the church. And I'm going to purpose to ignore that. Because the enemy would have you distracted for these five C's I want to warn you of. The first is the C of comfort. It's so easy to plop on your couch and to veg, to watch YouTube, to watch Netflix, and just be a person that is of the screen, to live in comfort. It's so easy to be comfortable and just jump into the sea of comfort instead of the adventure of faith that God may have for you at Kid Life. Or the adventure of faith that God may have you serving as a counselor in our youth ministry. The adventure of faith of ministering to your neighbor next door or reading a book about Jesus. You see, it's so easy to jump into the sea of comfort. What about the sea of complacency? I want to warn you. 
It's so easy to wake up one morning and jump into the sea of complacency where you don't read your Bible, or you say, I'm not going to church, I'm not going to that worship night on July 14th. No, 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 I, I, I'm okay. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you've walked away from God. It's so easy to jump into the sea of complacency. What about the sea of compromise? And the enemy comes your direction and he says, just do it once. Nobody will ever know. He comes to you and he says, you're the only one that can get away with it. If you just do it one time, I will never come back and tempt you again. Just go ahead. Just bite the hook once. Tell that to the bass at the end of my line. And he comes with a sea of complacency. He comes with a sea of comfort. He comes with the sea of compromise. He comes with the sea of culture. And i got to be honest with you. You never realize what you're in until you're out. And it's amazing how we think our culture is always right until we enter into another culture like Idaho. From Orange County. I'm a Christian. Everyone's a Christian in Orange County. <laughs> and I got to Idaho and I realized, is there a more Orange County in me and the way I think than there is a difference in me in the way the Bible thinks. And the pastor challenged me, you're on the front line. Well, am I on the front line because I'm from OC and I'm from South OC and I'm letting my culture dictate who I am? Whether the kind of bathing suit I wear or the kind of movies that I watch or the kind of things that I see or the kind of things that I'm a part of, am I an Orange County person or am I a Bible person? See, we've got to be careful to jump into the sea of culture because we don't even realize the culture that we're in until we're out. And the way that we get out is we let the Bible determine what our culture is. What about the sea of connections? The sea of connections. Bad company corrupts good morals. Who's my friends? Who's my girlfriend? Who's my boyfriend? Who do I hang out with? And sometimes I want to warn you that my connections can lead me astray instead of build me up in Jesus Christ. And so I've got to be careful with the people that I hang out with. And what Paul does is he warns them. But then he challenges them. I want you to see what he challenges them. It's red letters in my Bible. Take a look. It's Acts chapter 20, verse 34. Jesus says... It's more blessed to give than to receive. Oh, come on, Chad. Is this about money? Is that what Paul is leading us to? He's got, they've got to give money? Why would Paul say this about Jesus? It's more blessed to give than to receive as he's wrapping up this spiritual retreat. Now, this is not about money. The Holy Spirit is using the Apostle Paul to give a spiritual secret about our faith to stay in the Hume High. And it's one word. It's the word give. Give. Give is the essence of the gospel. You learn this. For God so loved the world that he gave. The essence of our, our faith is the word give. And I'm not talking about money. And if you're new to our church, we don't even pass an offering plate. So I'm not about to put a thermometer up at the end of this message. No, the word give is vital to our faith. And what I want you to do is see through Paul's life how he gave. Take a look. It's Acts chapter 20. And I'm going to go real quickly through this word give. Take a look. Acts 20 verse 22. And see now, I go, bound into the, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. First letter G, give. You see, as believers, we see that God gave his son, and what Paul is doing is giving his life. As believers, we give, we don't take, because our Savior gave and so we desire to give our life in the same way that our Savior gave his life for us. And what Paul is saying, I am bound in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem because 
I have given my life to Jesus, and whatever Jesus wants me to do, I'm going to do it no matter the cost. And if he wants me to serve at Kid Life, if he wants me to serve at Hume Lake, if he wants me to serve as an usher, if he wants me to minister the gospel, if he wants me to go to Africa, wherever he wants me to do, I'm now bound in the Spirit, letter G, I've given my life because he gave his life for me. I'm not going to take from Jesus. He's already given. I'm going to give him my life. Let her eye take a look. Not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. Let her eye. Indomitable. Indomitable. Let me explain. Paul knows what he's called to. Paul knows he's bound of the Spirit. Paul knows what he's up for. Many chains and tribulations. And Paul knows that the Spirit has promised him and said to him that he is going to face many trials. And he says, nothing's going to move me. And I don't even count my life dear to myself. Um, you guys know I was a swimmer in high school and college. And there was an international meet that I wanted to make the, uh, the relay team. Because let me tell you about swimming. It's a very boring sport. You basically stare at a wall your entire athletic career. You're either looking at a wall below you or you're looking at a wall in front of you. That's all you do. There's no like camaraderie. There's no like, you know, um, hey, let me throw you the ball. It's you dive in, you swim, you're on your own. But a relay was like, oh, I'm on a team, like high five, right? It's, when you're swimming, there's like a homeschool high five. Now, I don't know if you know what a homeschool high five is, but we homeschooled and a homeschool high five is this because you got no one else to high-five, so you just high-five yourself, right? Well, swimming's kind of the same way. It's like a homeschool high-five, but when you're on a relay, so I did everything to get on this relay and get picked for the team, and I got picked, and I knew what it would cost me. I knew I would have more time in the pool. I knew that I would have to practice longer and practice harder. In fact, one particular practice, my coach grabbed my big toes and made me for two hours walk around the pool deck wheelbarrow on my hands till my palms were bloody because he didn't think that my upper body was strong enough and he didn't want to put me in the gym, so he just let my body weight as he wheelbarrowed me around the pool for two hours. I knew what I was going into. I knew what was in front of me, and I kept going because I wanted to win. I had an indomitable spirit so that when I got on that block, I wasn't thinking to myself, we're going to lose. No sense to keep swimming. When I got on that block, I turned around, I gave my team a high five, and I said, we got this. That's what Paul's saying. Letter I, indomitable. We got this, man. I've been picked for Jesus' team, and I'm in. And Jesus Christ died for me, and I've received him as my personal Savior. And I don't care what the world says. I don't care what culture says. I don't care how the enemy tempts me. I got this, man. I'm on Team Jesus, and I'm going to rock it for him. That's the indomitable spirit of the Apostle Paul. Letter V, he says this so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, you want to finish? Are you sure? And you want to finish with joy? I made a list of everything that Paul went through to this point. Listen carefully. He was blinded for three days when he came to Christ. On his first missionary trip, he was lowered in a basket down a wall because they wanted to kill him. He then heard about John the Baptist, excuse me, John the Apostle who was beheaded. He was persecuted at Antioch. There was a plot to kill him at Iconium. He was stoned as if to death in Lystra. He had internal struggles with other believers about theology. He was in an argument with his buddy, mentor, friend, Barnabas, and they separated ways, he was jailed and beaten in Philippi, persecuted in Thessalonica, he was demeaned and degraded in Athens, he was tried at Corinth, there was a riot on his life about, in Ephesus, and there was a plot to kill him on a boat. And Paul said, I'm going to finish my race, but I'm not just going to finish, I'm going to finish with joy. Church, let me tell you something, letter V, 
We are victors, not victims. You go to counseling today and they will try to find someone to blame your problem on. And they will take you to a place where they will find something in your life. Well, that's why you are where you are. And I'm not going to say anything negative about that particular style and form of counseling, but let me communicate something to you. It's not the way of Christ. If anyone was a victim, it's the Apostle Paul. They tried to kill him everywhere he went. But he says, I'm not going to live in victimhood. I'm going to be a victor because I know that my suffering, like he said in Romans 5, produces perseverance. And my perseverance produces character. And my character produces hope. And can I remind you that blame is the second sin in the the Bible. Eve ate it. Adam blamed it. And we've got to make a decision. Am I going to be in the Hume High? Well, I can't be a victim. I've got to be a victor. And I've got a purpose to finish my race with joy. That's what the Apostle Paul says, despite all that he's been through. Despite, he could have said, God, I quit. Look what I've had to go through. Look what I've had to experience. Look what these people did to me. Not the Apostle Paul. He goes, thank you, God. I'm going to finish my race with joy. I'm a victor. I'm not a victim. Letter E. He says, here's the ministry that was given to me, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Evangelize, not minimize. Evangelize. You want to keep the hume high? You want to keep the church high? You got to tell people about what's happening in your heart and your life. Do you see how brave, do you know how difficult it is to get in front of you guys? Do you have any idea? what it's like for a junior high to stand in front of you and tell you, let me explain what God has done in my heart and life. Now, when you saw Torin and when you saw Carolina, were they up here like this? Yeah, God changed my life. (laughs) I'm completely miserable now. (laughs) You'd never believe, like, come to God. Woo, it's a real winner, you know. No. I gave my life to God. And I've realized, like, what I was missing Now, you hear a testimony like that. Why are you afraid to tell people how they could be set free? Why are we afraid and why do we minimize the gospel instead of evangelize the gospel when we see the fruit of it in the lives of two students? They're not up here miserable. They're free. They're joyful. They're happy. They're living an abundant life. That's what we offer with the gospel. It's the good news. We don't minimize the gospel. We evangelize the gospel. And telling others about our faith is what keeps us in the place of the spiritual high. Now, in no way, shape, or form am I saying there won't be valleys. But in those valleys, when we choose to give our life purpose with an indomitable spirit, be a victor instead of a victim, and evangelize the gospel, we walk out of the valleys and begin to climb back up to the mountain. When Andrew came in contact with Jesus, the very first thing that he did, students, he went and found his brother, and he said, I found the Messiah. And my prayer is that this group of students will change Orange County. And i got to tell you something. I believe it. You're not the church tomorrow. You're the church today. And church, I believe that about you. Anyone who comes to church on the 4th of July, you're like the real deal. And I really believe that God wants to do something with you in your world.